Left, got the blueprint, study my movement More than the two cents, was losing Now I'm oozing with success, and I got the tools To beat the stress I That was some kind of smackdown, wasn't it? Just some kind Just, <laughs> oh They decided they was gonna have a uh, a lot of goings on on SmackDown. There's a lot to talk about. And with all the TKO business floating around, man, there is a lot of news and notes for us to go through. This is going to be, this one's going to be a while. All right. So, uh, get yourself a nice Gatorade or something, something to drink. Hopefully you're doing something non-productive on this Saturday. And, uh, you just got a little bit of time because we're going to be, we're going to be here for a while. First, we're going to start with the rock line. The Rock is a liar. And I'm not going to let The Rock lie to me. So, what, what was The Rock's lie? Well, he goes on College Game, game Day or whatever show Pat McAfee has on ESPN. Pat McAfee puts him on the spot. Asks him, why did he not wrestle Roman Reigns at WrestleMania? Or is that match actually going to happen? He gives this long, drawn-out, about two-minute response. Where he talks about wanting to create something that people have never seen before. Something new for the fans. Then he starts talking about how in early 2022, he sat down with Nick Khan and over some Terramana. They talked out that they were going to do the match at WrestleMania 39. So the people start cheering in the background because they're in a live studio or whatever. And he says, okay, we could do the match. But the match, okay, fine. But then, like... WrestleMania shouldn't be the end. It should be the beginning. And he just kept talking about they wanted to create something new, something that's never been seen before. But they couldn't figure out what it was. So we just decided to put our pencils down and come back to it later. I'm like, this dude is... <sighs> Rock, you're full of it. You're just full of it, bro. This is the same guy. Who said, okay, yeah, we we were going to do the match. In early 2022, we were going to do the match. And then we decided not to. And then the reasons that they decided not to is vague. Extremely vague. And then at the time, there was all this chitter chatter about The Rock not being in ring shape. I remember Roman Reigns went on Jimmy Fallon. And then it came out that The Rock wasn't in ring shape. And then Brian Gerwitz, who knows The Rock personally, said, Well, The Rock never said that. So, it was, uh, The Rock's too busy doing movies. Uh, The Rock's not in ring shape. Uh, we had an idea. We agreed to do it. It was going to happen. And then we didn't know where it was going to lead to. And now it's just maybe at WrestleMania 40? Maybe. Like, oh, come on. Come on. Then, of course, he also blamed the merger. Like, oh, everybody knew the merger was about to happen. I'm like, bro, if you don't... <sighs> I can see... Look, Nick Khan and, and, and the, the Rock, they're good friends. They grew up together. Yeah, I can see them sitting down trying to hash it out. I get that. But... There's 101 excuses why this rock hasn't done it. And then he came on this on this episode of SmackDown. Not to get too far into the episode, but he avoided everything bloodline. He didn't even mention the bloodline. He stayed away from anything bloodline related as if it was infected with lice. So uh, there's just this thing is not happening. <laughs> okay? So I'm on the fence. I this thing is not happening. All right. Whenever somebody, you got to take a hint, bro. Whenever somebody is telling you a hundred different reasons, if a girl, you know, you ask a girl out on a date two days before, she's like, oh, I got to uh, get my eyebrows arched or I can't go out. And I haven't gotten my toes done or whatever the hell. She's just making excuses, bro. She ain't going. All right. It, it just, it's, a, it's a lie. If it keeps happening, just take a hint. It ain't happening. Until The Rock literally gets in the ring with Roman Reigns. I am not asking nor looking for this match, all right? It ain't happening. And I think it's pretty clear that it ain't happening because if it was going to happen, it'd happen by now. Now, now, I will say this. Now that the deal is done and the company has been sold, there's probably a little bit more money floating around and that is more likely to make it occur. 
Money is a great lubricator. You know, you can get pretty much anything done with a little bit more cash. Now, again, I'm not asking for it nor looking for it anymore. But it would be nice if The Rock would find his way into fitting into this storyline. I don't see why he people keep putting him on the spot, keep asking him about it. I think if he wanted to do it, he'd have done it by now. I just he ain't doing nothing but getting older, man. And Roman's getting closer and closer to retirement himself. People are online arguing about whether the Rock should wrestle Roman at WrestleMania or whether it should it should be Cody to finish the story. And there's people who are thinking with you know their wallets, and some people are thinking with their wrestling brain. Wrestling brain is saying you know finish the story, Cody Roman win the belt, yada yada yada, do rocking and Roman at Royal Rumble or do it somewhere else. People who are thinking with their wallets, you know, are saying, uh, Roman rock WrestleMania. That's the, that's the move. I mean, why would you do it anywhere else? And, um, it seems to be, he don't need the title to do it. So if you could have Roman lose the belt before that, you know, whatever. But ultimately I don't expect this to occur. All right. I just got this fool line just. I got the vibes. Whenever I, like I said, man, dude's been lying a long time. They've been lying a long time, man. So I'm just kind of like, okay, he lied. I'm not even concerned with it. It is what it is. Whether it happens or not, I don't even care anymore. Anyway, let's move on. We got a lot of stuff to get through. So Nick Kine spoke on your boy Phil, CM Punk, with cause, by the way, with cause. And uh, he made a comment about feel that uh i think kind of nukes the idea that he's going to end up working in wwe so he says listen we have respect for phil we appreciate his run here we appreciate what he did and tried to do with the ufc not many people can actually get in there and do what he did so we have respect for phil we wish him nothing but the best no we have an interest or we we'll sit down and have the conversation or Nothing. We wish him nothing but the best. <laughs> you know, he already wiping his hands of it. Um, we know that these people are... Look, the thing about the McMahons and Nick Khan and all these guys is they're all business people. They do business with Satan himself. And, you know, if, if it meant getting you to watch SmackDown or whatever. They don't give a damn. So the idea that they'll never work with CM Punk again, I don't believe that. I don't believe... That. There's, they'll never work with Chris Benoit again, all right? But CM Punk, as long as he's still above ground, he hasn't done anything that's going to get him in prison for the rest of his life, there's always an opportunity and always a chance that he'll be brought back. I think that was basically him being dismissive and saying that, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We wish him nothing but the best. We're not going to pursue that. But um, ultimately, WWE gets in their slumps where things are not going very well, and if they need a injection in the arm, here's Phil. And I can see that coming. Maybe one of these post-WrestleMania slumps, here comes Phil. You know, or, you know, we need somebody for the Hall of Fame, here comes Phil. We need somebody to go to Saudi Arabia. Here come, Well, he's probably not going to go to Saudi Arabia, right? But, you know, there's always the the opportunity that might occur where he might be useful for business. But I don't think they're really pursuing it in terms of the way people want this. And they never really was pursuing it. I don't know why people keep getting upset about this or obsessing about this. They were pretty clear when he left that they kind of didn't really want him back. And uh, <laughs> really didn't go out of their way to try to get him back either. You know, um, so uh, it's been pretty clear. All right. So Nick Khan also talked about uh, now that they've merged with the UFC, they want to start doing what's called TKO All-Star Weekends, where UFC and WWE invade a city on the same weekend. So it would be a block of shows where it would be essentially SmackDown on Friday, UFC on Saturday, a WWE pay-per-view on Sunday, and Monday Night Raw, essentially all in the same general area. And People were like, oh, it's a fantastic business. It's such big. I'm like, you got four shows competing with each other. You're competing with yourself. How much money do you think people have? 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, even if it was a holiday weekend or something like that, how much money do you think people have? You, in, in one town? That's a lot, bro. Running four shows in one town, that's a lot. Especially different products, too. You're going to run UFC and WWE in the same. Like, who's going to run the bigger building? That's going to be my question. You got UFC, you got WWE. Which one gets to run the big building, the big famous NBA arena or whatever? And what, what the other one has to do what? Move into a small rinky-dink building? Come on, are you serious? It's, it doesn't seem like a, a solid money-making idea to me. You know, um, it looked like it might work, I guess, depending on the city. Like, it might work for... I think they tried it in Las Vegas where I think WWE and UFC ran the same weekend. I hell, I think it might even ran the same night. I think they left the WWE show and went over to the UFC show the same night. Look, I don't see it. I don't see it working. This it, and not because of we'll talk about it in a second about you know Dana White's comments about the crossover and the fans, but you're talking about some WWE is an expensive ticket. UFC is an expensive ticket. You're giving people four opportunities to go to a show. One would imagine the UFC show is going to be pretty well priced and it's going to interfere with the cost of like you give people the choice of going to SmackDown raw or the pay-per-view. They're going to choose the pay-per-view, right? Clearly. Um, some people are going to choose UFC clearly, you know, so you're going to get essentially the runoff on <laughs> On Fridays and Mondays, and you may even have the lower attendance in those areas because they're regular TV tapings and not, you know, some kind of super show, super event. Um, I just, I don't think that'll work. Maybe they got, maybe, I mean, it's always an opportunity that they know something I don't. And, you know, Nick Khan's a very smart guy. Maybe they looked at these business metrics and said this would be a great idea. But I'm thinking about it and saying, you're trying to attract tourists to an area for a weekend. That's a very expensive weekend. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, it just is. When you look at the state of the American economy, you have to live in a bubble to think that people are going to be able to come in from out of town, probably stay in a hotel, go to Raw or SmackDown or, you know, just a pay-per-view event or go just to the UFC show and then go back home. That's crazy. You know, that's nutty. Like, WrestleMania, maybe, but you think you're going to be able to run Backlash and then some ranky dink UFC show on the same weekend and think that it's going to be huge business? I don't know. I, I just, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, they also have been talking about packaging UFC and WWE in terms of their rights deals and television. I don't think that's going to work either. I just don't think this stuff is going to work the way they think it is. Um, the, the the fan bases are desperate. Not desperate, but disparate. That means they're too, they're too different. So Dana White was asked about that question about, you know, hey, uh, how much do you think are the crossover fan base between WWE and UFC? And he basically said he doesn't think that there's much of a crossover fan base um that mma fans are mma fans and wrestling fans are wrestling fans and to a degree that's true to a degree at the same time why did he bring in brock lesnar if there was no crossover why did he bring in cm punk if there was no crossover clearly there's some crossover between ufc and wwe fans i don't think it's more than 30 percent but there's essentially a lot of crossover between the two. All right. A lot of people, UFC fighters like wrestling, you know. Um, so uh, they also talked about, I guess I got to add this to the list of things. We're going to talk about it next anyway, about UFC fighters finding a second career in WWE. is okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. So Dana White tried to downplay the, the fan base as being a crossover. Like, you already got in just the four days that these companies have been put together that 
<laughs> Dana White is like, there's not going to be any sort of WWEification of UFC. And there's not going to be any UFCification of WWE. These are two separate companies still conducting their same business. They're just going to be able to help each other with marketing and they're going to be under the same roof. Just like you and your brother are two separate people with the same parents. That's all UFC and WWE are. But somehow people think it's the same thing. It's like, no, it's not the same thing. And there are a lot of people who are, you know, fight fans who are not fans of WWE and will not watch that product no matter where you put it and no matter what you do with it. They won't watch it. There's always going to be those people. There's going to be always be those people who think that UFC is barbaric. You know, they're punching each other in the face for real. What are they, retards? We not, why, why would I watch that? You know, um, it's low-class, violent garbage. I mean, it is what it is. You can't, you can't force those people to watch the product. That's why I think the idea of trying to package everything together, to me, it doesn't, I don't think it works. Unless, because somebody has to be the alpha in this situation, regardless of what other people might be thinking. If you do the All-Star Weekend idea, Who's again, who's going to get the bigger building, the big, nice building? You know, is it going to be UFC? And then WWE is left with the rinky dink buildings or are they going to use the same building on two different nights? I mean, that's, I guess that's possible. But, you know, what about ticket prices and all this kind of stuff? Like, there's so much that goes into it. You know, how is it? that WWE is always going to be on Sunday because they just went and tried to establish pay-per-views on Saturdays. And now they don't want to compete with their brother because now they're stepbrothers. Now, all of a sudden they have to go back to Sundays because UFC wants to do Saturday nights. Why does UFC get Saturday nights? <laughs> like, why is that? Like, why do they get Saturday nights in the divorce all of a sudden? Why can't WWE just run earlier and UFC runs later? You know, I, I don't see why that, that's usually how it works anyway. The real fights in UFC don't even fucking start till 10 o'clock. You know, Vince can start, stop a show at 1030 or something like that. And then tell everybody to go on over to ESPN plus to watch UFC or whatever, you know? And then if you say they're going to run the same venue back to back. So clearly we're talking about B shows because WrestleMania, it takes them to build that set for a week. So you're talking about maybe as soon as they tear down the cage, they had to work through the night to build the WWE set in the same building. That's just nuts. I, I don't, I don't see it happening. It sounds like a nightmare. It may be my, my brain too small, you know, and I, I can't think on the same level as, as big brain Nick Khan and Dana White and who are all the other super geniuses that are trying to put this together. But I'm sitting here and thinking about this and saying to myself, how, how is that going to work? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know how it's going to work. I'm sitting here thinking about how the pace stuff is going to work because, uh, I'm pretty sure pro wrestlers are better paid than UFC fighters. And I'm not even one of these big UFC fighters. Oh, they should get paid more money. Kind of guys. I'm just kind of like, I'm pretty sure Brock Lesnar makes more money than like 90% of the UFC. <laughs> you know, so I'm pretty sure Roman Reigns pulls in more money than 90% of the UFC. How do you, uh, now that they're under the same umbrella, how do you justify that? You know, like, I don't, it's just something to look at, you know? Like, I heard ridiculous stuff like, you know, Matt Riddle's making two, three million dollars. I don't know if that's true or not. But I know that there's most UFC fighters ain't making two, three million dollars. So, <laughs> so that leads us into the next thing where they're talking about guys having a, a post MMA career in WWE. They've been asking a bunch of fighters about it. And pretty much most of the fighters are, you know, somewhat open to it. And, uh, if it's a right fit for them, you know, they saw Ronda Rousey do it. They see you know, Tom Waller has done it. The thing is, it's not for everybody. And you don't want to Enoki this thing. You just don't want to turn WWE into the retirement home for busted up UFC fighters. For people who might have some talent, okay. Even if they're not a particularly good UFC fighter, like somebody like a, that was kind of mid, like Matt Riddle. All right. You know, um, but 
like the higher level fighters. Like you think like could Conor McGregor maybe pull off a, a wrestling match maybe every once in a while. But you think they want to pay that guy to be on the roster every week? Like, come on, that just seems ridiculous. And plus, he made so much money, then probably not. And then we go back to the to the original issue, where sometimes these guys can fight for fifteen years, and then they're in WWE for three years, and they make more money doing that than they ever did when they was fighting for real. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know, man. I'm sure there's going to be some people who are going to jump ship as they get older and decide I'd rather do the WWE thing. But then when they start getting hit with those travels that traveling mm, and not, you know, I don't know, <laughs> no fight camp. Nobody standing over you telling you, you got to cut weight. Mm, you might, uh, I, I'm not I'm shit talking UFC. I'm just saying it's a different culture. Okay. That's all I'm saying. There's nobody standing over you telling you to cut weight in WWE. It might be people telling you that you need to get in shape, but there's nobody going to be telling you to here, put this brown bag, this black bag on and get in the sauna until you faint. Uh, mm -mm. There ain't going to be none of that. <laughs> so you can, I don't know. Some people need the discipline of a trainer and all that kind of stuff. And other people don't. It's clearly they don't need to be under one umbrella for this to happen anyway. So, it's just one of the millions of things that they're throwing around out there. Another thing, this is the final thing on the, the, the UFC WWE combination thing is now that Vince McMahon is the executive chairman of TKO. He owns 16% of WWE, but he also has ownership stake in TKO. Technically speaking, he is the executive chairman of TKO, which includes the UFC. So technically he's Dana White's boss. Now, that's got people thinking as Vince McMahon with his mustache, which is not even really Vince McMahon as much as it's Vince McMahon in disguise, um, is going to now bust into the offices of the UFC with his cane, because apparently he's walking with a cane now, and start telling Dana White how to do his business. No. I'm telling you, bro. They already ironed all this shit out. A lot of these ridiculous concepts that people have got in their head that Vince is going to start booking UFC. No, it's already been talked about when they started doing this. It, the conversation's already been had. He's probably not even going to touch UFC. The only thing is he's going to probably pay attention to how they're marketed and promoted, probably to their TV uh, deals and stuff like that, pay-per-view buys, shit like that. Who's fighting who? Probably going to have fuck all to do with Vince. It's all still going to be Dana White. You know, it's like, you know, Triple H is still booking Raw and SmackDown. I just think Vince is going to start. He's going to be able to have fun in his final days. He's going to go and fuck around on Raw and SmackDown. And he's going to be so busy with that. Dana White can set fucking UFC on fire. That's Ari Emanuel's problem. All right. And, and that's going to be like the end of it. <laughs> so I don't think Vince is going to fuck at all with the UFC. Why would he? What the hell does he know about fighting? He, he he was one of the idiots that was involved with the Inoki <laughs> Muhammad Ali stuff. He don't know shit about booking fights. He booked a brawl for all. What the fuck does he know about booking fights? He doesn't know shit about booking fights. No, he's not going to. And they would be an idiot to let him. He's almost 80 years old. He's just sitting in this chair until he dies out. That's it. He's going to have fun. Continue playing with his little action figures in WWE. He's not quite Stan Lee, not quite, but he's getting pretty close to being basically Stan Lee, and he's likely not going to have any real authority when it comes to the UFC, and if he ever even tries, he's probably going to get a phone call that says, look, man, just let this guy do what he's doing. You go play with your toys over here. We, we doing some other stuff over here. I don't know why people think that just because he can be involved with that, that he would be. He doesn't know that business. You know, this this whole thing was put together based off of everybody trying to maximize what they know. This is why Ari Emanuel wanted Vince to continue to be involved so that they can maximize WWE. This is why they still have Dana White in position so they can maximize UFC. 
They're not going to let vets, you know, start knocking over plates and stuff in the UFC. No, they're not about to start letting that happen. That's ridiculous. You have to start thinking with your, with your, with your pockets at some point. These people are ruthless business folks. They're not petty tyrants. You know, well, Vince can be a petty tyrant sometimes, but that I'm sure they're going to give him more than enough to keep him busy, uh, over in WWE, you know, especially since the TV deals and that kind of stuff is still not done yet. He's going to have plenty to do rather than bug Dana White about what's going on over in UFC. I can almost guarantee he's probably not going to give a shit. He's got his money. He made like a hundred million dollars off this deal. He, you know, put WWE when he thought was good hands. And now he's, again, he's going back to his workshop to tinker with his toys. He's probably not going to be involved with UFC at all. Technically, he can. He has some govern governorship abilities over the UFC as executive chairman. But just because he can doesn't mean that he will. This is probably just a ceremonial seat. Not really something for him to actually have any authority or any power. You know, so just chill out. Stop overthinking it. Stop letting the dirt sheets get you all riled up. Like Vince is going to start, you know, telling Dana White that he needs a garbage man fighter or some nonsense. Like, come on. No, it's not going to happen. Okay, let's get into this electrifying episode of SmackDown, which got a lot of people buzzing, a lot of people talking. But, you know, it was okay. It was okay, though. It was all right. It was a lot of nostalgia. And, uh, and once the surprises started popping up, a lot of the other stuff didn't matter as much. So let's uh, let's get into this. So Pat McAfee shows up to start SmackDown. Didn't know he was going to be there. He's immediately confronted by Austin Theory, who uh, called him a goof and said they got unfinished business and that he's going to drop him and uh, send him home like Aaron Rodgers, which... Which was an, which was a kind of a funny line, but it would have worked in a different venue. Then uh, he says that this is his show. This is Austin Theory Live. So Pat McAfee's like, that's where you're wrong. You don't get it. This ain't Austin Theory Live. This is the people's show. And then here's, if you smell. And then The Rock comes out there. Everybody's going batshit. Babies are going in the air. Roman candles are being fired off. I don't know. It was it was bananas in that building, All right? It was absolute banana. It was it was a hep- it was pandemonium, as a uh, <laughs> gorilla monsoon used to say. It's pandemonium in here. So the Rock chewed the scenery. I mean, really chewed the scenery. Then his old finally, you know, killed it. Austin Theory, of course, cut him off immediately because that's he's a heel. That's what he does. Uh, Rock told him to shut his bitch ass up. And then he did finally. So he got after he got his gimmick out of the way. Austin Theory cut into him, said that he was the real Austin, that he's the future. He's going to be the entire Mount Rushmore. So the Rock cut him down a little bit, got the crowd to chant, "You're an asshole," at Austin Theory. This whole thing was bleeped out, by the way. You couldn't hear a damn thing. I mean, the, whoever was doing the the muting, they earned their paycheck today. That guy's probably got the sorest single finger of most people in the United States right now. He's in there jamming that button, just jamming it. It's like he's playing some video game, like one of those old arcade games, like Turtles in Time or something. He's just jamming, just jamming, jamming that button. And, uh... Trying to stop all this, but they're chanting, you're an asshole. They got half the building chanting, you're an, the other half chanting, asshole. It's all being muted. They didn't reverse it. And Austin Theory stood there the entire time. Start. He eventually started yelling for people to shut up. That only made him do it even more, which is good heel stuff. Then The Rock says that he doesn't know who he is, but he knows what he is. And then said he was going to whoop his ass, and which made Austin Theory throw the first punch. The Rock dropped him with the spine buster, people's elbow. Everybody's happy. Then Pat McAfee comes in and does the world's worst incarnation of the people's elbow. It not only is not a people's elbow, it is an incarnation of the people's elbow that is 
absolute so bad that it might not even deserve to be called a people's elbow. It basically was just an elbow drop. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was pretty much it. All right, fun opening segment. Austin Theory got to work with Rock, Austin, Vince, Cody. It's just he 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 had to interact with Roman for a short time. They're really giving Austin Theory the rub. They're making sure that everybody, you know, shines the kid up a little bit, gives him a little something that he can learn. And, you know, I I think that this was cool. You know, this was very cool learning experiment for him. Yeah, he got beat up by The Rock. I mean, it is what it is. But it was a, a good learning experience. And if you're Austin Theory and you don't have much going for you, being able to say within the same calendar, two years, I think, in the calendar, you've interacted with the two biggest stars of the Attitude Era and two of the biggest stars of the New Generation Era. And, you know, the biggest star, one of the biggest stars of the modern era, two of the biggest stars of the modern era, then you've done a good job. You know, you got to wrestle quite a few legends. You, you're doing good in terms of, getting the rub, getting visible, being in there with people. And I think he stood his own when it comes to being on the mic too. So it is what it is. In terms of the rock, the rock does what the rock does, which is a lot of gimmicky uh, stuff, but it was fun because you hadn't seen it in a while. Um, so it was good. You know, I, I, I like this. The opening segment was fire. It was very good. Uh, the rock was backstage with Pat McAfee. Uh, I don't know what they were talking about. But it's, it clearly looked like Pat McAfee dragged The Rock to this show. <laughs> Even though <laughs> Deion Sanders dragged The Rock to Colorado. And then Pat McAfee started asking him about WWE and then dragged his ass to this show. <laughs> it looked like The Rock didn't want to do it in either one of them, by the way. Um, so he ended up standing face to face with John Cena, who looks like a radically different person. I mean, John Cena looks like somebody's dad now. Like, I know he's over the age of 40 now, but Jesus, he looked like he drive a Subaru. I mean, Cena just, if he wasn't dressed the way that he was dressed, I wouldn't think he was John Cena. I, I would legitimately think that he's one of these Sterling Heights dads who takes his daughter to the mall. And then he sits in the big comfy chair while she goes in and out of Spencer's gifts. This just feels like he is in dad mode. He's Uncle John. He doesn't look like a wrestler anymore. But he welcomed The Rock back home. The Rock was good to be here. They get a big hug. It was a good moment. Nice little moment. I enjoyed it. Good moment between the two. Of course, everybody's like, ah, Hollywood goes on strike. All of a sudden, The Rock and Cena both show up. <laughs> yeah, how about that? I'm surprised about that. I'm very surprised, especially since uh, Brian Gritz said that, uh, it would be a bad idea for The Rock to show up in WWE while they're on strike in Hollywood, but he's not doing shit else. The guy's probably fucking bored, man. I mean, what is <laughs> he's, what else is there for him to do? He might as well go ahead and pop the uh, the the crowd, you know, over in Denver. Why not? I mean, it doesn't matter. It's fun, you know. He needs some good publicity anyway because this whole uh, Maui thing ain't quite working out for him. You think, you think I wasn't going to bring up Maui, that him and Oprah are running some kind of scheme that they're supposed to be trying to raise money for Maui and people are kind of calling them out on it. It's all certain kinds of people, by the way. Every dollar helps, but they think just because you're a millionaire, you're supposed to give everything away instead of, you know, helping to raise money, which is what millionaires typically do. You know, Lou Rawls did it for years. I'm not saying Lou Rawls is like an ultra billionaire or anything like that, but he leveraged his celebrity into trying to get people to donate money for causes that he cares about. You know, Rock and, and Oprah are trying to do the same thing, but The Rock has been getting savaged in the media for the past two years, from the Black Adam stuff to the Warner Brothers stuff. To, you know, uh, some of his uh, show getting canceled. So there's been a lot of stuff out there that's been negative about The Rock and the Maui thing is just the newest one. So he needed some positive publicity. So him popping up in WWE 
is a positive. You know, because wrestling fans don't give a fuck about the rest of that stuff. Wrestling fans have a very unique ability to only give a fuck about what happens on wrestling shows. They literally don't care about anything else. That's how we can watch wrestling even during COVID. You know, that's why SmackDown could be the first show post 9-11 or whatever the hell. And it is what it is. They're not canceling it. We have a remarkable ability to ignore the rest of the world and singularly focus on fucking wrestling. <laughs> you know, so The Rock, hey, The Rock's back, everybody. I don't care about all his losses and all the L's he took and him supporting Joe Biden and anything else. I don't give a fuck about none of that. The Rock's here. He's on my television, which is good. Also, The Rock has gotten a bit of a dub because his show Ballers apparently is kicking ass on the streaming services. So I don't know if people were watching it when it was on TV, but from what I'm hearing, people actually watched it more now than when it was actually on. So I don't know. I think it's from, I think it's on Netflix and it's getting like really good numbers on Netflix. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm just rambling at this point. Finn Balor wrestled AJ Styles and won with a crucifix. What on earth? Of course, Jimmy Uso and uh, Damian Priest and Dominic Mysterio were all involved with this. Uh, after Damian Priest and Dominic were ejected, Jimmy Uso came in and cost AJ Styles the match. Uh, Finn Balor then thanked Jimmy Uso while Paul Heyman was in the cut watching. I mean, he was. It's it's very strange to see Paul Heyman try to hide. Like he's very bulbous. You know, you can you can't miss him. He's a, he's a, he's literally the penguin from Batman. You can't miss Paul. He's egg shaped. Anyway. Uh, Finn Balor walks over to Jimmy Uso, thanks him for his help. Uh, Jimmy Uso says he owed him one from when Judgment Day helped him last week, and he always pays back his debts and whatever. So Finn Balor pitched the idea that uh, he knows he missed his brother because you know in Irish in Ireland Irish world you don't have brothers you have brothers. So you you know you miss your brother, and I miss my brother. And then he suggests, of course, that both of them should join Judgment Day. There's no leaders in Judgment Day, so there's no Romans. And so Jimmy thought about it, let a pregnant pause occur, and then said, ah, I'm good. We good. Notice he said, we good. He's speaking for Jay, too, which, you know, probably shouldn't do, but it is what it is. Later, uh, this thing comes to a head. Uh, in the main event, well, in the, the final segment, I should say, where Grayson Waller is talking to John Cena. Now, I was concerned about this being the final segment, that it wouldn't get the, that The Rock would overshadow everything that happens on this show, which it did. The Rock overshadowed everything that occurred on this show. So, Cena being on this show and being advertised, <laughs> Cena's supposed to draw you, The Rock keeps you here, right? So, uh, Grayson Waller turns the show into it by himself, and he kind of does the same thing that the Miz just did. He tells John Cena that he wants to give him some advice on how to be a good host. Then he tells John Cena that in order to be a good host, you got to sit back and let the stars shine. But he made it all about himself, like he usually does. And he says that it's all cover up for the real truth which is that Cena doesn't want to be a wrestler anymore. He ain't been the same since his good buddy Austin Theory beat him up at WrestleMania. So now Cena's offended. He took his shirt off, took his hat off, which uh, <laughs> which uh, Grace Walter mentioned earlier, says uh, when adults start talking, I, I would take my hat off. Like my, I think he says his mom taught him to or something like that. But Cena just continued to sit there with his hat on. <laughs> Before Cena could retort, uh, Jimmy Uso came out. Now, I want to talk about Jimmy Uso's theme, It Rules. It's actually better than Jay's theme. Even though Jay's theme is a, bit, a little bit of a, a reworked version of the Uso's thing, it's just me, Us. Day one is just me, Us. It's okay. You know, it's it's not as good as the original theme. I, I can say that, though. It's a little bit different, not as original. I would have made a recreation of the original with you know, the same lyrics instead of just adding different lyrics. But uh, Jimmy Uso's theme is a mixture of the Uso's theme 
with little bits of Roman Roman stain, and it's it's a little bit more character focused too, about you know him basically putting his family last and now being out for himself. I like this. It fits his gimmick. They they released both Uso songs on uh, YouTube. So if you haven't sat down and listened to the, the Jimmy Uso theme, go listen to it. It actually encapsulates his character very well. So he comes out there. He puts the crazy eyes on John Cena. And then uh, said that Grayson Waller, who he called Kangaroo Jack. <laughs> Kangaroo Jack. He said that Kangaroo Jack has a good point. Nobody wants John Cena here. And he dares John Cena to try to embarrass him like he did last time. Now, this leads us to Sola Sokoa and uh, Paul Heyman. So, earlier in the night, The Miz was defeated by LA Knight. The match was hard fought. You know, I, I think it might be a shade. I think their payback match was probably better. But uh, L.A. Knight wins the match. Then he says he's coming for gold. And he doesn't care if you're Gunter or Rey Mysterio or Roman Reigns. And L.A. Knight, yeah. And then he goes about his day. Simple promo, not too much. Not doing too much. But Paul didn't like that. Because this was the first time in forever that somebody has mentioned Roman Reigns' name. And reminded people that he was a champion on this show. So Solo said that he was going to handle L.A. Knight. And then Paul was like, wait a minute, who told you to do that? You don't have orders to handle L.A. Knight. You should focus on Jimmy Uso because Jimmy Uso thinks he's in the bloodline and he's going around picking fights with John Cena, picking fights with AJ Styles. These are fights you're going to have to fight. You've got to handle Jimmy. And so Solo looks at Paul and says he's going to handle it. And he says, well, who gave that order? But who gave that order? And he's, <laughs> who gave that order? Call Roman Reigns. It's a, his red bat phone, which is hilarious, by the way. I love that phone. The phone is brightly colored red, so you can't miss it when he puts it to his chicken lips. Anyway, uh, this takes us back to the John Cena segment, because as Jimmy Uso was out there getting in John Cena's face, Solo Sokoa came out there, and he got in John Cena's face. So then Jimmy Uso was behind Solo, like, yeah! Now what you gonna do? <laughs> now what? We gonna whoop your ass! And then Solo grabs Jimmy by the neck, like he gonna give him the Samoan spike, and Cena's rubbernecking, like, what's going on over there? And then he gets kicked in the face. And then Jimmy Uso and Solo beat the tar out of John Cena. Uh, Jimmy then tries to get Solo to give him some dap, as if they're actually working together. And uh, Solo, eh, not really, not really down for that. Not not really involved with that. It didn't matter anyway because AJ Styles ran out there and it led to the fight scene, and Cena and Styles fought everybody off, and Solo and Jimmy started to flee. So would have been a nice spot for the rock, wouldn't it? It would have fit the story too, wouldn't it? Not just the story of, Hey, the rocks in the bloodline, but the fact that the rock and Cena g gave each other a hug earlier. Why wouldn't the rock come out and help his boy when he's getting jumped by his cousins? Uh, this is the, uh, the rock avoiding these guys. Like they got bed bugs. It's not, helping this storyline at all okay and now i know he doesn't want to be involved because if he's not going to continue to be there why involve him but it would have been a nice moment and it would have been a great moment to have rock and cena staring down jimmy uso and solo sokoa and it could have been something they could have talked about uh going forward especially when roman comes back about how you know the rock was here where were you when the rock was here that kind of thing, you know, that, that kind of shit that you could have definitely built off of in the future. You know, Roman could have dared the rock to come back, you know, come back when I'm here and that kind of shit, you know, something fun. Now, AJ Styles is perfectly fine. Now, don't get me wrong. It's fine. And I know this is leading to a tag team match. That's fine too. Just eight. When you have, it's crazy. Again, when the rock is on the show, it's one thing if he's not there. 
then I'm, I'm not asking for something that's impossible because he's not fucking in the building. He's already in the building. And he's not there. This is crazy to me that you would bring him in for anything and then say, oh, yeah, we want you to work with Austin Theory, but that's kind of it. We don't even want you to. I thought, especially when they were doing the backstage stuff, that he would bump it to Jimmy backstage. And, you know, they would have words. He would probably bump it into Paul Heyman. They would have words. Or whatever the case may be. Not, you know, too much where he's fully interjecting himself into the story. But that they would acknowledge, that's a good word, each other and that this story exists. The Rock bypassed that shit completely. I mean, he went around that motherfucker, you know? <laughs> he's going he's going anywhere but anywhere near Roman Reigns, okay? He's not going to be within six degrees of Roman Reigns at any point in time. So <laughs> I don't I don't know, man. It, it it is what it is. But okay. AJ Styles and John Cena are gonna be partners. Um interestingly enough, I know that Gallows, they said he's injured. That's why he hasn't been on SmackDown and but AJ Styles not dressing down the OC for not helping him. That's a that's a plot hole. You would think the first time you got jumped by some guys and your friends didn't help, that would be a problem and you would want to address that. At least that's what I would think. But I don't I don't know. I just think logically about wrestling shows. At least you could have had him yell at Carl Anderson over the phone, like, where the hell are you, man? Where y'all at, man? Why, why I'm getting my shit kicked in? Where y'all at? You know? But, uh, I don't know. I don't know nothing. AJ Styles and John Cena as a tag team against Solo Sokoa and Jimmy Uso. Okay. That works. It gets them, It gets me to where I was, where I wanted to be, which is Solo Sokoa and Jimmy Uso as a tandem. I think it's the right decision. Now, maybe Jimmy's going to end up turning on Solo. Ha <laughs> ha. How about that? So, uh, Pretty Deadly, I forgot they existed, because they've been gone for so long. Anyway, um, the injured one is, has a bedazzled sling, and he's in a wheelchair, despite the fact that he tore his shoulder, <laughs> which is funny. Um, so, Adam Pierce says that he thinks that they're going to be ready to compete soon, and so then the the Platinum Blonde, this I think it's Elton Prince, Decides to go into this soliloquy about how he can hear his own bones breaking and that he's not quite over his injury and that there's plenty of things worse than a physical injury. That's why he's in the wheelchair because he has emotional pain. And then Adam Pierce uh, basically says, look, I already know I got your medical records. You're going to be fine. So, <clears throat> you know, they give each other a pep talk and then they talk about how they're going to be back. Um, I love Pretty Deadly. This was silly. I wish they had been on TV this entire time. I don't see why they both need to be off TV because one of them is hurt. That's kind of silly. Next, the LWO is holding court in the ring. Rey Mysterio says that he came to SmackDown. Everything was, he was at a crossroads, you know, and he was lonely. And then all of a sudden he found a new family. He found a new family, the LWO. And this day reminded him of what a family should be. And uh, now he's a United States champion and he's very happy. Santos Escobar says that he was extremely happy, very happy, that Rey Mysterio stepped up when he couldn't and that Rey Mysterio was the United States champion. But it was his dream to face his mentor for a championship. And so he proposed a challenge to Rey Mysterio. Saying, you know, he would like to wrestle Ray for the United States title. Very friendly. Ray played like he was offended at first. Like, really, Santos? You're going to ask me for a championship match? And Santos is like, respectfully, yes. <laughs> you know? So Ray accepts. They hug because they're friends. Everybody's friends here. Lashley comes out and... The crowd goes nuts for Lashley. They're chanting Bobby, Bobby. Lashley cuts promo. Says that uh, you got tag teams breaking up. You got these guys hugging. Our takeover is going to be easy peasy. So then the Street Profits started making fun of the LWO. And then the other two guys, 
who never talk, one of whom Cruz del Toro, he spoke so fast and garbled up so much, I don't think anybody had time to chant what. It was just like, and then that was it. And then next you know, DJ Z is talking. And I'm just like, what? I'm not about to rewind it, but it was it was hilarious, whatever it was. Um <laughs> So this ended up being a tag team match in which the Street Profits won pretty handily. In fact, it was damn near a squash match. Um, afterwards, Lashley was actually pissed at the Street Profits for not finishing the job. So they went back over there and continued stomping the shit out of the LWO. Lashley then joined them. Rey Mysterio got in the ring and some did Santos Escobar and they ended up bopping them too. So I'm guessing they're going to have the Street Profits are going to start chasing the tag team titles while Lashley is back in that got damn United States title division. <sighs> Okie dokie. All right. Sure. Whatever. I'm not a big fan of this, but okay. We're going to have Lashley and his squad uh, going against basically all the other squads. Cause he squared up with judgment day too. So he's squaring up with anybody who got a faction at this point, not just, you know, baby faces, but also heels too. But they basically just jumped and beat up. The LWO, so they basically are heels now. Um, Street Profits are heels. Interesting. I know they've been heels before, but it's official now. You beat up a bunch of guys after a match for no reason. You're the heels. You're the bad guys. Um, surprise to everybody, which is national, what is it like National Hispanic Month, and they just now finding out that Lashley is Panamanian. I saw that on Twitter, and I was like, I could have sworn we knew that two years ago. When he won the WWE title, he was talking about going back to Panama or something like that, or his family in Panama. It was like, this is kind of like when people found out Batista was Filipino. <laughs> it's like, now that pretty much surprised everybody, but I knew uh, Lashley was Panamanian. Well, he uh, is of Panamanian descent, which means he's probably got some Panamanians in his family. He's got actual family back on the island. Um, not your stereotypical looking Hispanic man, you know, but he is technically Hispanic. Technically. Just like Bailey is technically Hispanic. You know, everybody keeps forgetting that Bailey is Hispanic. Uh, I, that's why I keep calling her Bailey Martinez. Speaking of Auntie Pam with the thick gams, she worked in the quote main event of this show. You, you heard me right. The Rock was on here. John Cena was on here, but this was the main event so bailey is backstage she's talking about how she meticulously put everything together since the creation of damage control why oh why is eo sky going off doing her own thing she's never wrestled oscar before she doesn't know anything about oscar why is she challenging oscar to matches so then her and dakota kai start debating about whether eo is going to be okay about uh, with this or is Bailey even ready? Is she still scared of Shotzi? Yada, yada, yada. And this leads us to the match, which not my favorite Oscar versus Bailey match. Uh, I saw some kicks that didn't make contact, punches that didn't make contact. Uh, they blew some spots. Mm, uh, it, it, both girls are better than this. Let's put it like that. It wasn't terrible. It didn't fall apart. It wasn't completely and totally awful. Nobody looks like complete shit, but you, they certainly both could do better than what they did here. Um, in any event, Shotzi popped up out of the crowd, scared Bailey. Uh, Oscar rolled her up and pinned her. Then uh, Shotzi slithered all over the ring and scared Bailey off. This would be more effective if she hadn't already beat up Bailey. You know, she hadn't already beat her up twice already. You know, it would be a little bit more effective. But since she's pinned Bailey twice now, it's not that as it's not as effective as it used to be. And plus, it's hard for these girls to get over when the rock's on the show and Cena's going to be there and all this kind of shit, right? Um, but at least they're further in their storyline. Um, Shotzi then tried to get a, a fist bump with Asuka, but Asuka was like, <laughs> no ready for Asuka, no fist bump for you. And that's it. That's it. Done and done. Oscar, no fist bump. Shotzi, she doesn't deserve it anyway. We all know this. Uh, SmackDown was fun. A lot of fun stuff here. 
Uh, good rubs for Austin and Grayson Waller. These two guys are getting a lot of attention. Notice that these guys are getting a lot of attention. They're, they're not doing a lot for like Brian Breaker. We thought it was great that Brian Breaker got to wrestle Dolph Ziggler. You know, he's going to get to wrestle Baron Corbin. Wow. You know, what a rub. Meanwhile, these fucking guys are standing across the ring from The Rock. <laughs> like this guy standing from across me from John Cena, and Brian Breaker is like, "Man, I'm getting a hell of a rub. I'm going to wrestle Dolph Ziggler on Raw in the middle of the show. That's great, you know. Yeah, it's fantastic, you <laughs> know, excellent. Um, but we all know that. Look, Brian Breaker is going to be, he's going to be the guy. I think he's probably going to. He may end up surpassing Austin Theory, despite all the rubs that Austin Theory is getting. But, uh, you know, so, but it's kind of crazy that when you think about it, how much they're really doing to benefit Grayson Waller and Austin Theory. And I like that because both of these guys are incredible talents and I like both of them. Uh, the Rock being back was fun. Uh, I'm glad it's for a short stint, not a long stint. I'm not a big fan of The Rock in large doses, small doses. Okay. Uh, Pat McAfee coming back was fun too. I thought it was fun. Um, uh, Michael Cole being a Pat McAfee mark is hilarious. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's entertaining. I don't know why. Uh, the matches, who cared about the matches really? It was not even about the matches. The Finn Balor and AJ Styles was good, but how could they have a bad match? Look at who they are. You know, um, Bailey and Oscar were substandard as far as I was concerned. But so this show was b- really bolstered by the segments. Some really strong segments on this show. Unfortunately, not a lot of it carries over into next week because nothing happened on this show where you, I must see what happens next week, which is a big, big problem, you know, um, is you had the rock out here. You had Cena out here. What are we going to see next week? Like, uh, what are we going to see next week? I don't know. But, uh, apparently now that the Endeavor deal is over, a lot of people that WWE has signed, um, before the deal are now going to start popping up. Apparently, um, now they're talking about you know it's time for Carlito to come in and Pillman Jr. and a bunch of other people that WWE signed throughout the uh, the period where they were uh, it being uh, acquired. So that's why a lot of these people have not showed up is because they were trying to wait until the deal was done. And then they're going to prune the trees, apparently. They're going to cut a bunch of backstage um, and corporate talent and then probably a couple of wrestlers. And then they're going to start bringing people in. Okay. At least that's what the dirt sheets are saying. I don't know that to be true. I didn't see nobody this week outside of The Rock and Pat McAfee, who just happened to be in town because of Coach Prime. Coach Prime. I didn't see anybody on this show that I don't normally see. So, again, what are we going to see next week? Don't know. All right, but uh, what do you guys think? What do you guys make of all this nonsense? Let me know in the comment section below. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace. Uh